Hi guys, and welcome to Worth of Mouth's first Zoom Zoom interview. We haven't got a name for this yet, but uh, <laughs> it's going to be the first of this series where we're going to be speaking to some of our some, some of our features on our website. Some of the incredible young people doing incredible work uh, within their communities and nationally. Uh, for those who don't know, Worth of Mouth is Worth of Mouth is a media platform which shares and celebrates the positive stories of unrepresented young leaders within the UK. And today, sorry, my name is Samuel and I'm the founder of Worth of Mouth. And today I'm with a very amazing young woman called Nazra. Nazra, say hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Nazra is, well, in fact, I'll let Nazra actually introduce herself because I feel like, you know, it's best to come straight from the person he does the walking, innit? <laughs> got to, you got to do the talk and the walk. You're doing the walk. But yeah, Nazra, please shortly explain who you are, what you do. Um, so I'm a freelance journalist, activist, um, and a public speaker. And I do a lot of work around um, ending violence against women and girls um, and write about race, diversity, anything that annoys me, basically. So I've been an activist since basically since I was like 15. Okay. Um, How do you know? I'm 23. Um, so I got involved with the um, with a charity called Integrate UK based in Bristol yeah. um, when I was 15 and I kind of started helping out with their conferences um, and they were kind of doing plays around um, issues such as drug abuse, uh, FGM um, and honour-based violence. So that's how I got involved and I wanted to kind of like improve my public speaking because I was a very shy, socially anxious child um, mm. and I had a confident older sister who was very much involved with all that work and I wanted to be like her I was like listen that um confident I want to be the same so that's how I kind of got involved you you said that you are you know you're an activist I think that's a very very important topic I actually want to learn more about what activism means to you what what does activism mean to you and why do you do what you do why yeah so I feel like for me activism is just um, being vocal about social issues, I think, and kind of educating people and having these conversations um, around whatever kind of what kind of whatever kind of activist you are. So for me, it would be around kind of like race, racism, and violence against women and girls. Um, and I think for me, um, one of the reasons why I got involved in doing activism, I think firstly I had a lot of energy as a child, and I was always very opinionated, like at home in school, etc. Um, but I didn't have the confidence to kind of, first of all, channel that energy and it wasn't nurtured. And I think from, from, the, from the charity that I was working with, that's how I kind of um, mm. grew into knowing that actually this is, this is where I need to be. Like, this is what I love to do kind of thing. Um, and secondly, FGM is something that's very, um, very it's a topic that's very close to my heart. And I know mm. I have family members who've experienced it. Um, for those that don't know what FGM is, it's female genital mutilation. Um, and... Yeah, I've had a few, I've had, I've had family members who've gone through it and it's something that has happened to a lot of, like, you know, a lot of girls from uh, uh, different backgrounds. And I didn't know that this was something that happened until the conversation came to me. And I was like, how the hell did I never know, knew, how did I not know that this was something that existed? Um, so that's when I was like, okay, I need to learn about, it. I need to educate myself. And this is when I was a teenager. Um, and then I kind of, um, after I trained in learning about it, I um, started kind of delivering peer education in schools around the country, um, which was an experience. Um, but then that's when I fell in love with doing like youth activism, working mm. with youth, uh, trying yeah. to empower them and make them confident and yeah, mentor them. And I think that's where. So would you would you get trapped? There's a lot of things I want to dive into what you just said. So just quickly, you see, you spoke about going to different schools to speak about that. Was that part of the charity? Was it because you just working the charity? Or was that something you did on your own accord? No, so it was part of the charity. So the organisation, they what we do is we go into schools, colleges, universities. We train like health professionals on these different topics, um, such as F and FGM was one of them. So at that time, FGM was you know the fight against FGM was very loud and it was very like high on the radar for a lot of people. Um, so what we did was we went into schools as one of them to kind of teach them about these things. Um, and also have a conversation around kind of why they need to be involved in the fight against it. And of course, you know, when you're going to like a black and um, um, a more like a school with more um, black and minority ethnic um, uh, students, I think it's a much more easier conversation to have because they understand the different cultural sensitivities um, around these kind of topics. 
uh, compared yeah. to just when you go to like a white school mm. where yeah. they have no idea. And I think that was a completely different experience. Um, yeah. Um, especially going to like private schools. So one of the things that we do is that we make like short films and music videos to get our message across. Um, so for example, on one of the topics, FGM, we made like a resource that goes with that and we um, show that in schools and then we have like a PowerPoint and then we go for it, it's like a lesson. Um, and it's the same with when we did work around like honor-based violence, racism, we have different movies for that. Um, and also for um, counter extremism like radicalization, etc. Okay. That was another one, especially Ooh. when the young girls go into Syria. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was, yeah, we were at the forefront of trying to go into school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was like a few years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, when it was like, that yeah. was all over the news and stuff. That's really, that's really, that's really impactful, man. You talked about your, your child a little bit. And like, I'm aware like, you know, you, someone obviously who's, who lives in England now, and I'm aware you obviously, that's, this, this isn't the, the country that you grew up in. And I think it would be really interesting to, to dive more into that and like, you know, your background and stuff. That would be really cool. So tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so um, I was born in Finland, in Helsinki. Um, and my parents were refugees. Um, oh, wow. From, yeah. what, from, from what country? Somalia. So my parents came to, my dad okay. first, because our parents all fled when the Civil War came in, uh, in the 90s. So oh, okay. So that's how my parents ended up in Finland. And then when I was seven, I think my parents were like, mm, there's not enough opportunities here for you as kids. So they yeah. wanted to move to the UK. So yeah, we came to the UK. I knew no English. But yeah, no, it was a very, it was a massive culture shock. Um, and I learned English through reading books. Um, wow. wow, that's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah, which was, which was very um, difficult, but it was a great experience. And um, my first book that I read was The Twits. So obviously the reason why talking to is because you, like a lot of your work on writing journalism has been you know, has been on loads of mass publications. Can you talk more about that? And like, you know, and how that even started, how you got onto that, you know, maybe off the, yeah, the first, the first big publication you've done, how that happened. What was the first one? So the first one that I did was the eye paper. And um, yeah, so before lockdown, before I, just for time, I've wanted to do like writing. I wanted to become like a journalist. I wanted to get my name out there. Like I wanted to write about things. I was tired of making threads on Twitter. Like I wanted, like I wanted people to Google my name and just know that oh, that's her opinion. Like do you know what I'm trying to say? Oh, oh so, so did you like, start by making threads? That you started. How did you start? No, no, no. So I was just like whatever I was angry about, I was just find about on Twitter. And like I was like, I, I'm not getting paid for this. Like imagine if I could actually just put this into like imagine yeah. if I could learn a new skill and like <laughs> expand my skill set and my career like <coughs> path kind of thing so I was like okay do you know what um so lockdown came and I was like do you know what? I'm gonna do it so I found I had a, a good friend of mine who um we met on Instagram and we started talking on there and she um helped me kind of she mentored me to help me like learn how to pitch um and then I found like this Facebook group that had like all these different editors on there those that were taking on new writers because I didn't have experience in writing like I didn't have like a blog or whatever, which is like usually how people do it. Like they have a blog to show as an example of their writing. Um, but I tried to use my um, other experience. So like, say if I had like a feature in a BBC article about the work that I've done, I'll be like, look, this shows that I'm actually like, you know, my opinion matters, like rather than being like, oh, let me write a blog for free and then try and yeah. like, I, was, I don't have time for that. So that's what I did. I was like, I, I tried to um, write about things that I had a lot of knowledge on. So the first thing was that um, the article around immigration and the worth of, the value and worth of immigrate immigrants in the UK after the immigration bill set up debate came about. Um, and yeah, so that's how I got my first commission. And I was just like, wow, I guess this is how it starts. And then it just went on from there. Um, and then I wrote another one for them and then Metro came and then Galdem. And now I'm just- Jeez, must, must have Metro just said, just said it lightly. Metro came and- uh, yeah, No, and you know what? <laughs> it was a very good one. Um, but it, it caused a lot of controversy because anything that, any, every time I write about, I think I told you this before, every time I write about anything to do with Somalis and Somali identity in a critical way, they just come from my neck. Like, they just come from my neck. <laughs> one, of your, one of your articles, you, you spoke about how you felt immigrants were perceived, particularly within the NHS. And you said how we shouldn't have to put our lives on the line to be considered worthy of living in the UK. So why do you believe this issue has been the case over the years and how do you think it should be addressed? You know what? I feel like, I feel like people, I feel like, especially in like British people, I think there's, this, do you know what? I think it's, it's with white Europeans where they think that they own, um, 
they own everything and like you know they they're very like oh my god we've got to close our borders and all just very they're very hostile i think and it's very interesting because they've taken from this whole world they've done so much so many things to ruin the countries that people are trying to flee and literally if if we try, try to do calculations as to how every country got to how it is today it dates back to white people and colonialism and slavery and you know that mm. whole trauma so i think mm. I think a lot of it stems from this selfishness and this greed that, you know, we see even today with the Tory government and everything that they're doing when it comes to money. They, they're spending billions of pounds on a, trying to give it to the private um, firms where their friends are own and whatnot, and they can't even feed kids, you know? So there's issues like this going on. Um, but I think the reason why I kind of said that they don't care about immigrants unless they're bringing value into the world yeah. or into the, into the um, services, because just before um, the coronavirus, people hated immigrants. They hated them. There was like, um, they were just always scapegoating them and so did the media. And, you know, there was this whole like, change in attitude from British um, people when they saw that the NHS workers were dying and it was blame NHS workers that were dying. And I think that's why I was like, what is, like, how, how are we suddenly changing it? And I thought, okay, hold on. Why is this the case? Now, if you look at a lot of the justifications that MPs are making when it comes to keeping immigrants here, they'll be like, oh, but they're part of their cleaners. They are part of our NHS. All of that, you know, they're making all these excuses for them rather than being like, actually, they're people as well. They belong here. Um, you know, like we've got, to, we've got to be able to have a diverse society. We've got to, people have lived here. Why, do, why do we want to deport people who've made yeah. their lives here? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. And this is the thing because the, the justification for um, so what happened was with the immigration bill, NHS workers weren't uh, part of getting a free. I think they weren't getting a certain service um, with the new immigration bill coming in, um, and people were fighting for. NHS workers to have um, to have like leeway kind of thing, and this was the justification used by um, left um, like left MPs saying, "Oh, don't let um, we need to, we need to actually value NHS workers because of the things that they've done for us, and they're putting themselves on the front line." Um, and it was accepted. Do you know what I'm trying to say? And it just goes to show how deeply people don't care about immigrants; they just care about what we do for them. They only value us if we're actually working for them. It's just it's getting boring now. Like it's just getting boring. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I feel like you're very aware of the issue and like you're passionate. Do you have any? Have you got any thoughts on like? Guess what kind of support can be offered to immigrants to make them feel more us that more part of the community, you know, wherever they are in the, in the UK. So my dissertation was on asylum seekers, um, mm. and I thought, okay, cool, we're going to find out about the attitudes of um, the British public, which is the cause of why asylum seekers are badly. But actually, the policies in the Home Office and in the UK are purposely set up in order to deter asylum seekers from being here. So they give them like literally chump change, like so small money and also mm. they're allowed to work. And this is so, like, yeah. and tell their, their people like, oh yeah, come here, the England is really good. That's literally mm. why, even though they what, are- what, there's, like, there's actually evidence of that. That's, that was the reason. Yeah, 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 there's evidence. They're trying to crack down on it and they're trying to make it a, such a horrible experience for them and not like a lavish, quote unquote, lavish experience. So they, they don't come here. Um, and you can see that through, just the way that they really? do the policies, et cetera. Yeah, and also they've signed, um, the UK have signed the UN Declaration of Human Rights um, and also the Convention for Refugees and Asylum Seekers, which also gives, if they've signed that, that means that if somebody has the humanitarian grounds to come to the UK, they, that means that the UK have to accept them. Now, these people that are coming here, majority of them are under those, like, that criteria. So what mm. the UK is technically doing is illegal. They shouldn't be doing that because they're breaking mm. international law. So next, next topic Again, big topic this this year. And that's the Black Lives Matter movement. You know what I mean? Um, of course, it's something that's still ongoing and Black Lives Matter and Black Lives, Matters, Black Lives Still Matter. That's got to be said. If you can cast your mind back to, you know, the whole... When, I guess when the movement was in its very, very... Lot, like, yeah, like at the very forefront of every, everything... And also looking looking back, what would be your say your major learnings, and how did you and how did you feel about the whole, how do you feel about the whole movement itself? Yeah, I feel like um, I think the first thing is, is I think there was a lot of like trauma felt, um, which I, I'm sure a lot of other black people uh, felt, and I think the whole I think the eruption of it and how people responded to it was very very uh, good. Um, you know, it's, it's sad that we have people listen whenever a black person dies, but they don't want to listen before it gets to that stage and people don't want to make changes then. Um, but I think for me, it was kind of bittersweet because on one side, yeah, it was great that people yeah. were involved. Yeah. 
another side is that like, oh like a lot of us have been doing this work for many years and yeah, suddenly, well. suddenly like you've got all these people that are making changes within a week within a few days so when 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 a lot of establishments were telling us oh like it takes a long time to make these changes it takes a long time to do x y and z it's like hold on mm. we, we, Mm. Mm. You're making sense. You're making say, sense. Like, You're making was, sense. So for me, I, I, I was a bit heartbroken because I was like <laughs> slapping that strategies in like five days. We've got a new strategy ready. You know, they they've got funding, they got resources, they're changing building names, they're doing a lot. Do you know what I'm trying to say? And I think that's why I was like, this crazy, is really painful. Crazy. I didn't even, I didn't even see that. Like that's actually imagine. Yeah, do you know what I'm trying to say? So and then you know, there's people saying talking about this thing called um aesthetic activism. Um, which is mm. where people have been activists for, you know, like the like image. Performative, isn't it? Yeah, performative. And I think a lot of people are were doing that because now a lot of them are silent. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Where are you? Yeah, it's and, just, um, just, yeah. So when everyone was talking, they weren't talk. Yeah, and then yeah. you see like, people taking like Instagram pictures at protests, <laughs> like doing a madness. Like um, it was just a lot. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Because you can tell, obviously, people are going to take pictures at a protest to remember this moment in history. I get that, but you can just tell yeah. all my like, influencers are there to just do up. Image yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's symbolism for our generation and and you know what i mean like you're like <laughs> we're not taking like we're, we're not waiting we're not we're not yeah, making the same yeah. mistakes a generation before is like kind of like we're very action based yeah yeah definitely and it's interesting because people don't know this that um there was a, a lot of community people older people were very angry that they weren't <laughs> organizing the protest um and they weren't they were feeling some type of way that it was young people doing it and they were making rumors about them and saying oh like it's all white people and all this like crap kind of thing um and look the first time that the young people organize the protest what happens they create changes that it's literally been a domino mm. effect around the world so i think for yeah. me it was a bit of sweet the whole the whole protest and all of that was a very bit of sweet kind of situation because on the one hand it's like oh um it's, it's great that people are listening now, but on the other hand, I'm like, hold on, but I, we've been saying this, but we're not, we're not saying anything new. You know what I'm trying yeah, to say? Yeah, yeah, exactly, and it's, exactly. And it's, given, it's just giving white people to like, it's giving white people the, the opportunity to like restart and be like, oh, yeah. no, it was like this. Like, no, like we should. Yeah, hella cap, hella cap. I swear I told you last week what I do, like, especially people in work. I'm like, you are very <laughs> because we work in this sector. We work in equality and diversity. So why are you not acting all brand new? Like, I don't get it. Yeah. But, um, what about yeah. and yeah? So you, I've I know you wrote an article in relation to Black Black, Black Lives Matter movement. I think you might have wrote a few. Can you talk more about that? You know who it was for, how that came about, and like the impact. Yeah. So that article was very um. It, that article came out of a conversation at the protest with with the homies. Anyway, so there was a little girl that came up to speak, and she was crying and saying, "Oh my God, we all need to love each other," and just being really sweet. Um, and for for everybody was just cheering her on, of course, as they should. But for me, in the back of my head, I was just thinking, hold on, why is it a young girl looking like the age of eight has to stand up there and cry and understand what racism is? Why are these little kids having to come to a protest and like feel that? Yeah, it's not. It's, it's not, not normal. normal. It's not normal. It's not normal because the white white kid Billy, he doesn't have to go through that. You know what I'm trying to say? He can just play with these toys and it's fine. Like you can do yeah. whatever I say. So I'm like, that. That's why it was very like. I was like, okay, cool. Like, so we was having a conversation about, it and I think. One person was like, actually, no, it's good for them to kind of come out and understand like what's going on in reality. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. But in an ideal world, we wouldn't have this happening. Um, and then, yeah, so that's where the article kind of came out of. It was like, you know, black kids don't have the privilege to just be kids. You know, we live in a white working class area. And I'm like, I'm sure they really wouldn't know that much about race. And even the kids as well, do you know what I'm trying to say? So I'm like, we need to be able to, when a child in that kind of space comes into a classroom, they have... Um, books there that are like black um, girls on the cover and black boys and like you know joyfulness and you know so that the teacher understands when the child comes to them and tells them that this person's being mean to me but I don't understand why but you the teacher should know like you know maybe there's some prejudice or discrimination going on here because it happens from a very young age. kids are mean kids are very yeah. mean yeah um, the next topic I want to talk about is another talk so you, you, you're not, as I said when you say activist you're very you're really an activist because you all the social issues I've seen <laughs> your, your work your work is out honestly I'm handing too many pots <laughs> nah it's amazing man obviously I think this is probably one of your I guess correct me wrong, one of your main social issues that you that you speak about which is obviously FGM mm -hmm. um, female genital mutilation so you've been campaigning like and fighting against that for quite a few years now but you said many people may not be aware of what it is or even you know that it, the fact that it takes place I guess he 
tell us more about the issue itself. You know, why is it still happening, and why people like yourself are determined to fight it against it? Um, I think yeah. So FGM is, in essence, in the simplest form, is um, the total or partial removal of the female genitalia. Um, and the whole kind of point of this is to control the female sexuality. And there's uh, three different, uh, three main different types. The four is contested. Um, and it can go up from just having like a part of like a, like a nick in the, in the genitalia to having all of the outer um, genitalia removed and it's sewn and leaving a size, the whole of a matchstick to kind of urinate out of and have their period out of. And obviously that causes issues because that means that they will be on their period for one month rather than one week, which means that they'll always be on their period. Then there's other issues such as um, childbirth. In a lot of countries, women die from childbirth because if they don't know how to do a cesarean and a child can't come come out the, the kind of natural way, the child is going to suffocate and obviously it's going to cause implications for the mother too. Um, yeah, this predates religion. A lot of people think that this is something to do with like religion or it comes out of religion, but actually it predates religion. It used to happen in Egyptian times. It used to happen in the UK back in the 1950s and 60s. Um, oh, then on that one. Yep, to cure um, cure um, homo uh, um, homosexuality, um, hysteria, um, and other forms of like mental health issues. And obviously that's really not going to work. But yeah, so that's kind of, what FGM is in essence. And it's, it's no different to other forms of sexual abuse and sexual violence. And that's why it happens. I think people try and other it because of the fact that um, it happens predominantly within um, BAME communities. Um, but it's it's not something that is other to that. And also I think, cause it's quite alongside other forms of like sexual abuse. I think it's quite invasive and very hidden because you wouldn't know if somebody has FGM unless they say it or um show like signs of like it if that makes sense which is again very hard to determine if that's to do with fgm so that's why it's very hard to kind of first of all tackle it and secondly um end it it's something that i think a lot of i think because because it happens frequently within um BAME communities i think there's an issue of racialization and racism and targeting that um authorities do towards the Somali community especially, which is why a lot of Somalis don't like to A, talk about it anymore, B, um, just hate the kind of connection between Somalis and FGM, um, rightly so. So I think it's very difficult to kind of make that distin like, distinction between understanding that actually it does happen, but it's not just um, a, a Somali thing, if that makes sense. But yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely just because like, I, I just think it's horribly wrong um, and it can be ended, you know what I'm trying to say? That people can be educated um, and it's much more common than we, we would like imagine kind of thing, mm. I'm trying to say. Do you, have, do you have any, any statistics that, that we, about the, how common it is, do you have, do you have any statistics? So in terms of in my head, I know that um, in Somalia, um, in the recent years, it was, there was a 90% prevalence oh, okay. oh. Um, of uh, girls going through it. Um, and it, now it's been made illegal there. But as we know, um, just because it's made illegal in the constitution doesn't mean that it's not going to happen because it happen, It can happen in villages. It can happen in places where there's not that much control. Um, yeah. And it's the same when you, if you look at kind of like South Africa, for example, South Africa has one of the, especially since the 1990s, it has one of the best, um, it has a 50-50 kind of parliament and also it has the best um, uh, policies when it comes to violence against women and girls. However... Yeah. It is known as the rape capital because of how right mm, it is there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. laws don't actually reflect the reality. Yeah, 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 of course. Of course. So what, what do you think can be, yeah, of course it is a I guess a long, a long journey to, to and obviously people like you who are fighting it are the solution. But yeah, in terms of like what more could be done for I guess the average individual to fight against this and, and to support the, the eradication of FGM. What, what do you what, what was your advice and can you say about that? Yeah, so I, I would say um, we need to kind of have an open mind and um, tread lightly when it comes to this topic in the sense that I understand that it's a very sensitive topic. And I think, thirdly, we need to, because I think, especially when it comes to the UK, people think that we're trying, we want to prosecute people, we want to prosecute families and we want to break them up. But actually, our work, especially around it, is to, to prevent we want to prevent yeah. it. We want to educate. And I think this is the thing is um, we need to continue educating youth, especially because they're going to be the ones going into certain professions. They're going to be the ones that are um, the next generation kind of thing. 
Um, but also we need to educate mothers and fathers and also engage them in the conversation. I think that's very important. Yeah. Yeah. Because if we don't engage them, then we're not really going to get um, to a more peaceful solution. Um, yeah. So that's what I would say. Amazing. And thank you for that. So, so final questions. Uh, so something we like to ask all of our guests because I feel like it's, it's a great question. If you were to meet a younger version of yourself, uh, you know, what would be one tip? If you have more than one tip, great, but what would be one tip you'd give yourself knowing what you know now? I would, uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll tell them like, like, just keep going. Like you're destined for greatness. Like just keep going. That's what I would say. Like you're, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna um, be doing some important stuff. Um, I think, yeah, and, and the reason, just the context for that is just because, yeah. you know, we go to a white school with um, white teachers, you know, as, as a black kid, a lot of them would tell you, you don't deserve, you, you're not going to get anywhere, you're not going to go to uni, and they try and treat you like you're lesser than you are. And yeah, the, uh, the tables turned, you know, over the years. And it wasn't until I got to college that I actually realised the, the potential that I had myself. Mm. So that's what I would say. And I think it would be an advice to anybody else. Don't let no teacher tell you that you're not going to get anywhere because you will, you will. Keep going. Come on, preach that. Now it's important. Self-confidence is important, man. Yeah. Because like, if you don't believe in yourself, who's going to believe in you? Like, my mom always, my mom always told me this, this, um, this quote, and, and like, I always like to share it. She says, um, if there's no, she says, if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do you no harm. It's a proverb. It's like, so it's, so it's, That's true. So, if you, what's what's happening right now? Like, like, what current projects are you working on? Is anything you can share for us to look to look forward to in terms of your work? Yeah, what have I been doing so far? You know what? Like, I'm I'm just trying to focus on my my writing and just keep keep going with that. But um, you know, in the last few months, we I was working with an organisation called Global Fund for Children and the Lottery Community Fund. Um, and for the last couple of months, we've been. Um, so the, the Lottery Community Fund, they had one million pounds that they wanted to give to um, black and minority ethnic organisations across the UK. Oh, wow. um, so for the last two months, um, we've been basically going through that, going through over a thousand applications. Wow. Uh, yeah, just going That's through. Them. And it, it was quite amazing to see how many applications are, like how many BAME organisations exist around the UK, especially like mm. in the North, et cetera. But yeah, no, so that's basically what I've been doing in the last couple of months and now it's come to fruition and um hopefully we will hear about basically all the organizations that have gone funded um soon so yeah that's good that's good now but yeah thank you so much nazra for your time honestly our first you know our first guest on on, on this video series that we're starting <laughs> honestly honestly you've been a great it's been a great conversation and i feel like time has flown by that shows how great conversation has been where can people find you like you know just please share please share your social media platforms or any other way people can find your work um yeah it was yours yeah so um google me no i'm joking don't google me google me <laughs> <laughs> so my Instagram is um, Nazra Ayub, um, Nazra underscore Ayub, and it's the same for my Twitter. Um, choose your pick. LinkedIn as well, same name. Um, what else do I have? Yeah, and if you want to read my articles, well, the sna snapshots of any of my articles are on my Instagram, so you can find them from Google. Google her, man. Type that in. Google. Check out the Wikipedia in that. You want to? Do? <laughs> I, mean, I weren't opposed to it. <laughs> <laughs> Check nah, out the Wikipedia. But, yeah. I wish Absolutely. one day you will see me on Wikipedia, but no, um, no, yeah. So just check out my Instagram and my LinkedIn. LinkedIn, if you want any advice, like just message me. So this is to the young people. If you want any advice, I'm still confused myself, but from what I've learned over the years, I can <laughs> yeah, man, you, have to just, you guys. <laughs> your reflections, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, like everyone, like, I feel like in life, everyone's, everyone's, everyone's at a different confused stage. <laughs> Honestly, it's never People stopped. Just less, someone just less confused. People are just less confused than others, but everyone's still confused. Everyone's just confused continuously. It's just, yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank and you. I hope thank you guys so watching enjoy this. And yeah, yeah. man, we will, we'll, we're excited to continue to see your work. And yeah, we hope to see you on Forbes, right under 30, you know, <laughs> Queen's. Queen's list. Actually, you got a, you got a, what's it called? You didn't talk about that. The Diana Award. Diana Award, yeah. Wow, you can't get that. So many, too many achievements. Too many achievements. <laughs>
talk about that really, really quickly, please. Um, yeah, yeah so um, I got the Diana Award and a shout out from Prince Harry um, for my work around um, FGM. So everything I spoke about in regards to like um, going into schools and mentoring young people, um, awesome, as well as consulting. Um, thank you so much. Consulting uh, my ministers uh, like David Cameron, Theresa May, um, and also working with other kind of like philanthropists and actors like Emma Watson to kind of like get the message across around. Mm. Okay, yeah. So you met, have you met these people like? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Sign like, sign like, like. Yeah, no, but Emma, Emma Watson was my favourite. She's, she's a babe. No, she, she's great. Like she really listened to um, kind of the work we've done and then she like invited me to come on a panel with her um, a couple of years ago to kind of talk about it. And then she funded one of our... Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but I'm gonna say it anyway. She funded one of our um, <laughs> one of our music videos um, that we made around um, sexual harassment because obviously she does work around the Me Too movement. Okay. So, yeah. So all of that work is what I one of, one of, the, one of my um, one of my young people that I've mentored and is a very good friend of mine nominated me for the award. Um, and yeah, that's how I got the Diana Award. Congrats. So, so what we so what what is it? What is it? How, what 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 is the award? Oh, is that you get like a. Yeah. Kind of thing. I think it's a certificate okay. because of COVID. I've been waiting for my certificate, but there is. Oh, all right, come here. Yeah. It's yeah. And I know, I know your mum's already brought a frame. Mad thing. Yeah. Your mum's brought a frame for that. I'm frame that up for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, my, my parents, my parents are, are the best. They're my biggest fans. So I expect nothing less. That's good. But anyway, see, so many achievements we did. And, <laughs> we didn't even, even mention that <laughs> way too many achievements even mentioned that but yeah is that the only award you've received have you, have you received any, any other awards as well yeah um i've got a, um i had the, the i've got like a tab like the tab um Muslim Special women award yes. <laughs> and i used to be an education officer i think i don't know if i mentioned that to you but i used to be an education officer for bristol su so i won the okay. of the year i won a couple of things basically i'm not gonna sit here and list them all but uh, listen, what you just told you got to be your biggest fan. I am being shy. List your awards. Um, yeah, well, I was, yeah, I've gotten 24 most, uh, 24 under 24 most influential in Bristol. Wow, um, God. and um, I've got like um, uh, like a BBC's uh, modern day suffragette recognition thing as well. Those are the ones that's, I can that's, that's that's awesome, man. Congratulations. I know there'll be. And you're only 23. I know they'll be <laughs> by the age of 30. But as I said, we're going to see <laughs> that behind you. We're going to see see how artists have their little plaques on their on their. We're going to be seeing other plaques and behind you in like five years of the awards. But yeah, they're an MBE soon, yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. I would never take that. Oh yeah, let me put that. I'll never take that. I'll never take an MBE. Let me just put that out there. Oh, because of what it what it yeah, symbolizes. Yeah, yeah. I've been very vocal, but I'll never take one. I'll take a Nobel Peace Prize though. <laughs> Come on, makes or sense. Or OBE, none of that. I'm not. That just goes against everything that I, I'm working towards. You know what I'm trying to say? I can't yeah. be able to colonize the curriculum and then go and take an MBE. Go grab it. Yeah, fair enough. Nah, oh. makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, thank you, Nazra. Thank and you so yeah, we hope to continue to see your success and uh, keep yeah. doing your massive, your, your great work, your inspiration to a lot of young people. You know, watching this. In the country, in the world, so please keep doing what we're doing, and you know you're gonna keep being amazing. So yeah, thank you guys for watching. This is Worth of Mouth's first. No, <laughs> still got to find a name for it, but you know, guest <laughs> video series talking to our to our to the young leaders of tomorrow. But yeah, thank you guys for watching, and goodbye.